everyone, welcome to the Sabbath School Study Hour. Whether you're here in the sanctuary with us, you're watching online at home in the local area, across the country, or around the world, I want to thank you for joining us. Today we are going to look at lesson number 10, but before we get to that, I want to point you to our free offering for the day. It's this small pocketbook titled Riches of Grace. And you can get that by dialing 866-788-3966 and asking for offer number 152. Or you can text, if you're in the United States, the code SH056 to the number 40544. And if you're outside of the United States, you can go online to study.aftv.org forward slash SH056, and we'd be happy to get that to you, and I think that will be a blessing to you. Let's begin our study with a word of prayer. Loving Father, I want to thank you and praise you for the Sabbath day. And Lord, we have come to study your word, and we're praying that as we open up your word, that the Holy Spirit will guide our hearts and minds, that the holy angels will be here with us, guiding and directing our thoughts, our hearts, our minds, and that, Lord, you will show us what you would have us do, and, Lord, you would be glorified through your people today. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Martin Luther once said that people go through three conversions. I want to pause just for a moment and let that sink in. Martin Luther said people go through three conversions. He said there was the conversion of the head, the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the pocketbook. And he said not very often do they happen at the same time. The title of our study this week is Giving Back, and it's all about stewardship of the things that God has given to us. That means our time, our talents, our skills, abilities, our bodies, and all of our material possessions, they all belong to God. Scott Roden wrote a book titled Stewards in the Kingdom, and on page 27 he says this, Stewardship is not limited to caring for financial resources, and to making sure that God gets his 10%, though that's certainly a part of it, so much more is involved. The term steward is misunderstood and even foreign in our society. We do not have any terms in our modern vocabulary that carry the richness of this term. And then he goes on to say, caretaker fails to capture the responsibility laid on the steward. Manager seems inadequate to describe the relationship between the owner and the steward. Custodian is too passive a term. Agent is too self-serving in our day. Ambassador is too political and it lacks the servant aspect. Warden is too administrative and loses the sense of the personal. And guardian is too closely tied solely to parental responsibilities. And so he's saying here that there's really no adequate word that can describe the responsibility of a steward. And so how do we use our time, our talents, our abilities, our material resources, all the things that God has made us stewards over. How do we use those? And how do we truly live out our responsibility to our Maker and our Redeemer? Well, the first thing that we need to know when it comes to stewardship is that everything that we have belongs to God. I want you to notice in Psalm 50, verse 10 through 12, it says this, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. 
I know all the birds of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine, for the world is mine and all of its fullness. Haggai chapter 2 verse 8 says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 and 12, in talking about God, it says, For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours, wealth and honor come from you, You are the ruler of all things. And then I want you to notice in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, it says, The land is mine, and you are but aliens and tenants. And so in all of these passages, we put them all together, we see that everything that we have comes from God. I want you to notice... In Testimonies for the Church, volume 2, page 652, it says this, The earth is the Lord's and all the treasure it contains. The cattle upon a thousand hills are his. All the gold and silver belongs to him. He has entrusted his treasures to stewards that with them they may advance his cause and glorify his name. He did not entrust these treasures to men that they might use them to exalt and glorify themselves and have power to oppress those who are poor in this world's treasure. God does not receive the offerings of any because he needs them and cannot have glory and riches without them, but because It is for the interest of his servants to render to God the things which are his. I want you to notice in that passage, there's two very important points that are made. Number one, it says that God gives us gifts. He gives us talent. He gives us material possessions. He gives us this time here on this earth so that we may use those things to advance His cause and to give Him glory. And then it goes on to say that He doesn't need us to give His money uh, or, or our time or our talents to Him as if He needs those things from us, but rather He gives them to us because it is in our best interest as his servants to render to him the things that belong to him. And so in the process of this life, God is teaching us to be giving, to be uh, kind to others, and to teach us to be like his son. That means that your role as trustee or manager or steward of 100% of what God gives you, He's requiring of you in this lifetime. I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, that it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. So if you think about it for a moment, what that's telling us is God is essentially testing us to see if we will be good stewards, faithful stewards of the things that he has given us. And so I want you to consider this for a moment. Your bank account record and your credit card statements are theological documents. Now I want to pause for a moment and I just want to let that set into our minds. Let's think about that. Our bank account records and our credit card statements are theological documents in nature. And you might say to yourself, well, what do you mean, Pastor Rod? How is that possible that a secular document can be a theological document? Well, it's very simply put this way. 
those records reveal who and what you worship. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what you spend your money on it reveals who and what you worship. You've heard the statement, put your money where your mouth is. And you've also heard that verse where Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. And I want to look at a parable that Jesus gave to his disciples, he gave to us. Luke chapter 19, and we're going to start in verse 11. I want you to notice, the Bible says, Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and because they thought, that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Now I'm going to pause there for a moment. I want you to notice that, Jesus, that, the, that the Bible tells us why Jesus told this parable. And it says that he told them this parable because they thought that the kingdom of God was coming immediately and he needed to reveal to them and to us that it wasn't going to happen immediately, that it was going to take some time. So notice what it says, verse 12. Therefore he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And a second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. For I feared you, because you are an austere man, you collect what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, Out of your own mouth I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, Take the mina from him and give it to him who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. For I say to you that to everyone who has will be given, and from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Here Jesus is clearly referring to himself when he is talking about a nobleman who is going to go into a far country. And we know that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem where he would be crucified, he would be resurrected from the dead, and then he would return to heaven to receive the kingdom from his father. But in this parable, he's saying that he's going to one day return. And those who don't know God, those who don't want him to rule over them, they will be destroyed. But those servants that 
were given talent, skills, and ability that did surrender their heart to him, did accept him as Lord and Savior, and, and ask him to come into their life, they are going to be uh, questioned at his coming, what have you done with the things that I have given you? And so while we wait, we live with purposeness. It is not a waiting in idleness, but we wait as dedicated disciples who are stewards over what we have been given. We are to be vigilant, watching for the coming of the Son of Man, and we must also be diligent, working as well as waiting is required, in other words, there must be a union of the two. We must put those things in balance. There is a watching and waiting for His coming, but there is also work that is to be going on. We are to put to work those things that He has given to us to develop our character and to make us symmetrical, make us balanced, make us well-rounded make us more like Jesus Christ. And so we are waiting for the owner of everything to return. And soon he will come and he will want to know what we have done with our time, with the talents that he has given us, with the money that, that we have been able to make because of those talents and skills, and he's going to be looking at those gifts, the time, the physical strength, and the material resources that we have been given. But brothers and sisters, the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back and is going to hold us accountable for the things that we've been given should not frighten us in any way if, in fact, we are good servants, if, in fact, we are faithful servants. And the accusation that we see here from this servant who had buried his talent in the ground and refused to employ it, as we look at that accusation, we realize that that accusation is totally false. And we should be able to see that because the other servants who did put what they had been given to use and to work to further the kingdom of God, they had no such complaint whatsoever. Every effort that they had put into their stewardship assignment was fully rewarded and it was worth everything that they went through when they heard the master say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you have been faithful in little things, I am going to give you more responsibility in my kingdom. Now, in our lesson this week, we took a look at a parable that Jesus told after a man came to him and asked him to help him settle a dispute with his brother over their inheritance. And Jesus said something very profound to this man. He said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that we possess. I don't know about you, but I, I think that Jesus is the greatest teacher who has ever lived. And I think I'm on pretty solid ground with that, and I hope that you would all agree with me that that is the case. But that really begs of the question, what makes Jesus such a great teacher? And of course, there are many things, but I'll point out just two of them. Uh, first of all, what made Jesus a great teacher is he could take the unknown and he could make it known. 
That's what a good teacher does. A teacher takes something that you don't understand or you don't know and they explain it in a way that you totally get it. You can wrap your mind around it. You can understand it. That's what made him a great teacher. And Jesus often did that by comparing the unknown to the known. Many times in Scripture, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, no one's ever been to heaven. No one knows what heaven is like. And so Jesus is trying to explain the unknown, but he does it by comparing it to what is known. And so he says the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a, a man who found a treasure in a field and hid it and went and sold everything he had and came back and bought the field. Jesus is taking those things that we're familiar with and he's saying it's like this. It's not exactly that, but it's like this. And so we can wrap our mind around that and we can understand that. The other thing I think that makes Jesus a great teacher is Jesus never beat around the bush. Jesus always got right to the heart of the matter. In John chapter 3, when Nicodemus came to see him and Nicodemus was trying to engage him in conversation and we know that, that you must be of God, you couldn't do the things that you do if you weren't and, and Jesus just gets right to the point. He says, you've got to be born again. He does the same thing with the woman at the well. He says, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he gets right to the point. Yeah, you, you're right. You've had five. And the one you're with now, you don't, uh, are not married to. And Jesus does the exact same thing here in talking to this man. This man wants him to help him settle a dispute with his brother. And essentially, Jesus is saying, the problem is not with your brother. The problem is with you. I'd like you to notice what the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 796, has to say about this story of Jesus talking to this man. He says, the man addressing, the, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary says, the man addressing Christ did not need more riches. What he needed was to have covetousness erased from his heart after, after which riches would be of little concern to him. If there were no more covetousness in the heart, there would be no dispute to settle. As always, Jesus went right to the root of the difficulty and proposed a solution that would preclude the necessity of similar problems arising in the future. So Jesus tells the man, the problem is not that you need more possessions. The problem is that you are coveting and wanting more and more, and that's not what you need. You need to get rid of that attitude, that desire, and if you uh, get rid of that attitude, then the, the dispute with your brother is going to go away. And to drive this point ho home further, I'd like to look at another parable that Jesus uses to illustrate that material possessions should not be the most important goal of our lives. I'd like you to turn with me back to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, just a couple pages back from where we were. And I want you to notice, Jesus is speaking, and it says, starting in verse 16, then he spoke a parable to them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. 
But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. I want you to notice that the problem of this man in this story is not that he desired greater wealth or, or it, the, the importance of the story isn't even to tell us how to prepare for retirement. The problem is this man's attitude towards the th blessings that he has received. I want you to look with me at verse 19 again. He says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I want you to notice that this man feels that he can now retire, if you will. He can now have a life of ease, and he has enough to provide for himself for many years. But the problem is that he sees that he can spend all of this on himself, and he does not consider being generous towards his fellow man or being generous towards God. I want you to notice in the book Christ Object Lessons, page 257 and 258, it says this. This man's aims were no higher than those of the beasts that perish. He lived as if there was no God, no heaven, no future life. As if everything he possessed were his own and he owed nothing to God or to man. The psalmist described the rich man when he wrote, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That is found in Psalm 14, verse 1. I want you to notice in Sunday's lesson, in the third paragraph, it says this. If we think only of ourselves and ignore the needs of others and the cause of God during this stage of life, and it's essentially talking about those retirement years, we are following the example of the rich fool. I don't know about you, but it kind of reminds me of that story in the Bible in Luke chapter 16 of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was clothed in purple and linen and lived sumptuously every day. But he had no concern for the poor man lying at his gate who desired to be fed from the crumbs of his table. I want you to notice that in this parable that we read in Luke chapter 12, that there's no indication at all that this rich man who had this abundant crop and was going to tear down his barns and build new ones, there's no indication there that the man was lazy or that he was dishonest. The problem was how he spent what God had entrusted to him. Because, brothers and sisters, we don't know the day of the coming of Jesus, or we don't know the day that we're going to die. And so we should always be ready, and we should always be carrying out God's will instead of building up treasure for ourselves. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before or not, but the Bible really has very little to say about retirement. Now, I'm at that age where I'm thinking about that. And it's very common for people to do that. But when we look at Scripture, we really don't see God desiring for us to have 
a retirement age, a, a, a life of ease where we rest and relax for the rest of our lives. And so there are examples in the Bible that we can think about. I, I think about Moses who was over a hundred years old and he was still leading the children of Israel. In fact, he was leading them all the way up to the point of his death. If you look at the story of Daniel, as Daniel was uh, high up in the government in Medo-Persia, all the way up into his 80s, we don't see where he had a life of ease or retirement. You don't see that with John, who was in his 80s when he wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I want to remind you of what we read earlier, where Jesus counsels us to not only be watching for his coming, not only waiting for his coming, but we are to be productive, we are to be working while we are waiting. I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 24, verse 44 to 46, it says this, Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Now in that word servant, we could put the word steward. Who then is a faithful and wise steward whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. And so here Jesus says there is a blessing for those who are, are doing what God has called them to do all the way up to either their death or up to his coming. Now friends, you've heard it said that you can't take it with you. And there's another saying that says you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Well, they're essentially saying the same thing, that when you die, you can't take your possessions with you. I want you to notice Psalm 49, verse 16 and 17. It says, Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, Paul was, uh, he was uh, sending a message to his young protege Timothy and to us, and it says this, Now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Now, of course, we know that there are two things that we can take to heaven with us. We take our character, and we are able to take those that God was able to use us to bring into the kingdom as well. But this specifically is talking about material possessions. You can't take it with you. And that's why... We need to find a balance between, especially in, in our older years, a balance between uh, living too long and outliving our savings and dying too soon and not providing for our families. And whether you are rich or poor or somewhere in between, we should be planning for the future. And brothers and sisters, that includes setting up a will or a trust. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Amazing Facts actually has a planned giving department. And we have people that are there who can help you to set up a will or a trust. And, and a majority of what they do, 
wouldn't cost you anything. And so that resource is available to you to make sure that you are planning for the future. Because in most states, in most situations, if you don't have a will or a trust, then your estate, whatever it is, often will be controlled by the state and they will give it to, most of the time, your nearest next of kin. Now, maybe you're okay with that. But then again, maybe you're not. Maybe that person, uh, you wouldn't want to be the one to take care of your estate. And so you should plan for that now. I want you to notice what it says in Testimonies for the Church, volume 4, page 480. That which many propose to defer until they are about to die, if they were Christians indeed, they would do while they have a stronghold on life. They would devote themselves and their property to God, and while acting as His stewards, they would have the satisfaction of doing their duty. By becoming their own executors, they could meet the claims of God themselves instead of shifting the responsibility to others. Now, if I could take that passage and I could just put that in my uh, own language, my own vernacular, it's simply saying this, rather than leaving our possessions for someone else to deal with, even though it may be a family member or a loved one, it's, it's giving us some sound advice saying if you are truly a good steward, if you are truly a faithful steward of what God has given you, then you should be planning for and, and, and you should be setting up for those things that are left when you're gone to go to the work of God and to your family. I want you to notice in Monday's uh, lesson, the last paragraph, it says, in the simplest terms, we can say that because God is the owner of everything, it would be logical to conclude from a biblical perspective that when we are finished with what God has entrusted to us, we should return to Him, the rightful owner, what is left, once the needs of loved ones are met. Now, I, I want to focus for a moment on that last statement. It says, once the needs of loved ones are met. And so that, when we're planning for the future, when we're preparing for uh, our estate and what happens to it after we're gone, we really should begin with providing for our loved ones. I want you to notice in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that Paul says to Timothy, and he's saying to us, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Notice in Mark chapter 7, verse 9 through 13, that Jesus says, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother... Let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received is Corban, that is, I'm, I'm giving what I have as a gift to God rather than to you, mom and dad, then you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother, making the word of God of no effect. And what Jesus is saying here is that we should be providing for our families. I want you to notice in the last paragraph of Thursday's lesson what it says. 
In short, good stewardship of what God has blessed us with doesn't deal only with what we have while alive, but also what happens after we are gone. Because unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, we will one day be gone while our material possessions, whether little or much, will remain behind. Hence, it is up to us now to make provision so that what we have been blessed with can be a blessing to others and the furtherance of God's work. And so here this is telling us that if we are faithful stewards, we need to be mindful of our responsibility of, of not only giving to uh, others and giving to the work of God now, but even planning for that after our death. And, and so there's also an issue that's intimated there that, that we don't want to hold on to what we have now so that when we die, we can give it all away. Ellen White had a very sharp rebuke for people that do that. Notice in Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 154, she says this, I saw that many withhold from the cause while they live, quieting their consciences that they will be charitable at death. They hardly dare exercise faith and trust in God to give uh, anything away while living. Those who hold fast their property till the last moment surrender it to death rather than to the cause. I guess that we would call that deathbed charity. But brothers and sisters, wouldn't you rather have a spiritual legacy. I want you to notice in Thursday's lesson, in the second paragraph, it says this. We are stewards of what God has entrusted to us. That is, He ultimately owns it all. And He is the one who gives us life, existence, and the strength to have anything at all. It is only logical then that when we are finished with what God has given us and have taken care of our family, we should return the rest to Him. In other words, what we're seeing here is we've got to be purposeful. We've got to be thinking about what is going to happen with those things that God has entrusted to us. Our and, and, and we want to think about our family and we want to provide for our family. But at the same time, uh, you want to be thinking about how much would go to your family and then how much would go to continue the work of God. And for me, uh, I look at uh, my family and I look at uh, who are those that need help who are those who would be good stewards if I did leave them these possessions? And there may or may not be some that I wouldn't want to give as much. I would rather put that work, uh, that, that, those resources to the work of the kingdom of God. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. And let's notice what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9, Jesus says to us, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Or excuse me, is that what he says? No. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Brothers and sisters, the accumulation of worldly things is generally motivated by a desire for security. And it reflects fear and uncertainty for the future. But Jesus points to those who would be citizens of his kingdom and that the possessions of material wealth is often, rather than a blessing, oftentimes it can be a source of anxiety rather than a means of escape from it. And so he says, rather than laying up treasure on earth, lay up treasures in heaven. What's he saying? He's saying that he would have the citizens of his kingdom make a sound investment in his kingdom. An investment of time, of talent, of our bodies, of the material resources that we have been given that he has seen fit to allot us with. All that a man owns in this life is merely lent to him of God and only the treasure that we successfully lay up in heaven will be our own. Did you catch that? The things that we have now belong to God. But if we give back for the furthering of his kingdom, we're building up a treasure there, and that treasure will be ours. That's what God promises. I want you to notice in the book Councils on Stewardship, page 112, it says this. Do all church members realize that all they have is given them to be used and improved to God's glory? God keeps a faithful account with every human being in our world. And when the day of reckoning comes, the faithful steward takes no credit to himself. He does not say, my pound or my mina, but thy pound has gained other pounds. He knows that without the entrusted gift, no increase could have been made. He feels that in faithfully discharging his stewardship, he has but done his duty. The capital was the Lord's, and by his power, he was able to trade upon it successfully. His name only should be glorified. And without the entrusted capital, he knows that he would have been bankrupt for all eternity. Brothers and sisters, what a powerful saying. And, and, and what a revealing of the responsibility that you and I have. And Jesus said that we should be found to be good stewards, faithful stewards of all that God has given us. And it really causes us to have to ask ourselves the question, what have I been doing with the things that God has given me. Am I going to be able to hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant? I want you to notice that in that, in that same book, Councils on Stewardship, this time on page 342, it says this, in giving to the work of God, you are laying up for yourselves treasure in heaven. All that you lay up above is secure from disaster and loss and is increasing to an eternal and enduring substance and will be registered to your account in the kingdom of heaven. You see, brothers and sisters, all that you give now and, and in your will, in, all 
that goes to the work of God is going to the kingdom of God and God promises you that that is secure, it is safe, and it will be there for you when you get to heaven. Well, I want to close today by giving you eight reasons why we should give now rather than waiting. Eight reasons. Number one, if we give now, we can actually see the results of our gift. A new church building, a young person in college, an evangelistic campaign funded. Whatever it is that you would give to, you will be able to actually see the results of your giving. Plus, you are also building up that treasure in heaven. Number two, eight reasons to give now rather than waiting. Number two, the ministry or person can benefit now when the need is greatest. Brothers and sisters, as we look at the world around us, I hope that we see that the need is great now. And as we give now, we can give to that cause of God that He has put as a burden on our hearts. Number three, if you give now... There will be no fighting among family or friends after your death. It's very heartbreaking and it's very unfortunate that in many cases when there's not a will or there's a dispute within the family that there's this fighting that goes on. And rather than being a blessing to them while you're alive, it becomes a burden and, and oftentimes there is this breaking up of the family that is caused by it. Number four, it sets a good example of family values of generosity and love for others. As your family members see you giving generously to others and to the cause of God, it has an effect on them to see your values. And it may certainly help for you to explain to them why you're giving your material possessions to a certain place. Number five, it minimizes estate tax consequences. Well, that one should be pretty plain to us, right? If you have an estate and someone inherits that, there's inheritance taxes. But if you give while you're alive, then that problem is done away with. Eight reasons to give now rather than waiting. Number six, it guarantees that the gift will be made to your desired entity. I have seen myself several times where someone did have an estate plan And they intended it to go somewhere, but there was a a court battle or something. Someone disputed, and now what you had intended doesn't happen. But by giving now, you can make sure that that doesn't happen. Number seven, it demonstrates that the heart of the donor has been changed from selfish to unselfish. And that is a powerful lesson for our families, our friends, to demonstrate that God has changed us. And I don't know about you, but I want it all recorded in the books of heaven. I want all of the angels to see that God has truly transformed my heart. Amen? And number eight, it stores up treasure in heaven. Brothers and sisters, is that the desire of your heart? 
to have a treasure in heaven that is waiting there for you. And when you get there, it will be in your name. It will be your account. It will be there for you for all eternity. I hope that this message today doesn't sound condescending or pointing a finger at anyone. As I look at this, I'm looking at it myself and I'm saying, oh, I need to be thinking about these things. And I hope and I pray that you will contemplate these things. And if you need help with a will or an estate, amazing facts can help you with that. If it's your desire to have that treasure in heaven, would you pray with me now? Oh, loving Father, oftentimes it's hard for us to uh, hear this kind of a message. But as Martin Luther said, we go through three conversions. The conversion of the head, the conversion of the heart, and the conversion of the pocketbook. And Lord, my prayer, for all of us that are listening, is that you would be able to have that conversion process take place in us. Perhaps we've had that conversion already, but it is a good reminder that you have made us stewards of all that we have. And we are being tested. And are we going to be found faithful? And Lord, that's my prayer, that we would, in fact, be found faithful and that you would be able to say to us, well done. Lord, have mercy on us. Where we fall short, show us the way forward and help us to be a blessing to others and help us to give generously, whether it's our time, our talents, or our material resources. Help us to give generously to the furthering of your kingdom and the hastening of the day of the coming of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. God bless you and have a great day. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.